This episode of Writing Excuses has been brought to you by our listeners, patrons, and friends. If you would like to learn how to support this podcast, visit www.patreon.com slash writing excuses. Season 18, Episode 43. This is Writing Excuses, world building in miniature. 15 minutes long. Because you're in a hurry. And we're really tiny. <laughs> I'm Mary Robinette. <laughs> I'm Dong Wan. I'm Aaron. I'm Howard. And I love short fiction, as we've already discussed. So I'm going to talk about world building in a short fiction world. Um, and I'm really excited to kind of, this is one where I don't have a great theory. I just kind of want to think about out loud, like, how much world can you put in a short story? And how much world do you need in order to write a short story? I will say that when I start uh, writing short fiction, I often just have a one-liner. I usually have like a Sour Milk Girls is the best example of this, even though it came out of a longer idea. It was, what if memory were a commodity? Um, And then my second question is always, who is suffering? Because I am me. Uh, And then usually that's where I place uh, my main character within that. Mm -hmm. But there is a lot of stuff that is not explained. And any of the short stories that we read. There's a lot of things you don't know about the broader world. And what I think short stories give you the opportunity to do is to take one or two aspects of a concept that have emotional resonance for your characters, dive into those, and then hand wave the rest. And if you can throw in a few small details that make the world feel big on top of that, all more's the better. But I'm curious what y'all think about, like, when you're reading or writing, what is the difference between what you see in a world in miniature versus big? Uh, for my own part, the the one idea, you know, this is a cool thing. I want to tell a story about it. How much world building do I need to do? I need to do enough extrapolative world building. Where did this come from? Where is this going? that I can be certain that the framework for the story I've created actually exists. You know, if you're, you know, what if memory was a commodity story, if there was something about the way commodification of memory went that made orphanages not exist, then suddenly, suddenly I've unplugged the story and I would have to go back and and rework it. And so that's, that's really the extent of it. I just make sure, hey, Is this a cool idea? Yes. Does this cool idea negate the way in which I want to explore the cool idea? And if the answer is no, I'm off to the races. Yes. I often think about, like, thinking about that, like, did I break it midway through? (laughs) So I I have this theory that every writer does something subconsciously really well. Um, You'll have writers who will say like the character came and spoke to me at night and like told me their story that never happens for me but I feel like those people just do character on a subconscious level and for me a lot of world building happens on a subconscious level where I'll toss a detail into a sentence I'll be like and then they went to I don't know whatever thing I random thing I decided to put in there and later I'll be like that doesn't necessarily make sense like in a world where memory is a commodity they're probably not in space so I probably should take the space elevator reference <laughs> out for example didn't happen but it could have and so one of the things I actually do is while I'm writing um I will sometimes keep a document open a powerpoint a lot of the time weirdly and actually put anything that I put in that's a world building element into a one particular slide on the PowerPoint so that at the end of drafting, I can look and be like, do these words actually (laughs) seem like they belong in the same world? Yes or no. If one is an odd item out, I need to go back and either figure out a way to make it make sense in my head or excise that and it needs to go into a different story. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's really interesting. That's a a really neat measurable tool. Um, Cool trick, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I, I, for me, it's, um, I, I will also just drop in random details and, and I find that, um, that when I'm specific about a thing, that it implies this whole larger world. And so I look for places where I can be specific about something that's not necessarily load bearing, that implies a larger world, but doesn't open questions. And that's, that's where you get into, uh, the, the tricky thing with, with world building is if you, if you drop in something that and then it opens a question about the story, like, well, why didn't they just ride the eagles? Um, you know, then then you then that's where you're creating a problem for yourself with the world building. Uh, so one of the one of the tricks that I use 
is how much exposition do I have to use to explain the thing that I've just dropped in? If it's more than two sentences, then it's a world-building detail that is uh, is distorting the story because I'm like, that's, that's too much. Um, the other piece for me is the difference in expectation between audience. Mm. Uh, so novel readers, I have found... Um, assume that if you didn't put something in, it's because you forgot about it because they're reading for that immersion. And short story readers are so used to putting the story together from pieces of implication that they they work on the idea that if it's not there, you left it out on purpose. And so, you know, you can you can say, well, I used a, a, a Terraport thing. And if, if you don't mention how that works, they're like, oh, well, it's not important to the story how it works. Yeah, I also love... One of the things that I think you can do and for short fiction audiences is use the way that pattern, that minds create patterns mm-hmm. to create that some of that broadness. Yes. Um, like if you say, you know, this is the third god of death. Okay, well, that's interesting. There are obviously two previous gods of death. What happened to them? I don't know. Maybe I don't need to say. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But it makes me think about audience expectation is when I started writing tabletop, you can't do that. Yeah. So if you put a detail into a scene you have to expect players will want to go talk to the first two gods of death or know what happened to them. Or if you create something that's like, you know, that came from the caves of pleasure, like someone's going to want to go there. And in fact, when I first started getting feedback back from editors, it was like, stop putting in these details that you do not have the word count to explain Mm -hmm. because I was so used to that short fiction thing that you do where you kind of drop the things out there and let people create it. But it's interesting to think that in novels, people will expect you to kind of build the world yeah. out that far. And I have a kind of a theory about why it happens this way. And this is sort of um, informed by my perspective from an editorial side more than a writer side, right? And that is to flip the iceberg metaphor in its head. The iceberg metaphor Ooh. being that, mm-hmm. like, you know, there's all this world building. We only see the top 10%, but the rest of it's below water. You as the writer need to have some idea what that is. Instead, the way I think about world building, and, you know, one thing that's also important is to realize that world building isn't a science fiction fantasy thing. It's not a genre thing. It is a fiction thing. Any story you're writing, you are including world building. Whether you're describing a a suburban cul-de-sac or a war zone or, you know, a high fantasy city, all of that is world building. Yes. Because every time you introduce a world detail, it is... You're introducing a rule for that world. So people think about world building as like a particular type of technology or a particular location. But for me, it is a way to tell your readers, your audience, what's important, right? Because if you are introducing university, then you're saying a certain kind of hierarchy is important. If you're introducing a type of magic system, you're saying that 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 logic is important, right? So what matters to your characters are the rules of the world around them, Um and so if you're saying there are police, then obeying the law is important in a certain way, right? And that creates character stakes, right? The problem you're running to the RPG is you don't have control over the characters. So every time you introduce a world-building element, you're introducing stakes for somebody. One of those stakes is, I worship the god of death. This is the third one. What the hell happened to the first two? I got to know, right? And so that becomes an impulse for that character to explore because suddenly you've established stakes for them mm-hmm. by putting something into the world, right? And so it, it is very useful. To, the iceberg metaphor is very, very useful. But sometimes if you're stuck about what do I actually need to include in this story, you can take a step back and say, okay, who is my character? What matters to them? What rules do I need to define so that they can make the choices that they need to make? And then be hyper-specific about which aspects of the world are you showing us to establish the emotional stakes for that character. See, we had uh, uh, James Sutter on the podcast years ago, uh, and he was one of the lead creatives at uh, Paizo. And his position for, you know, uh, third god of death uh, would have been completely opposite to what your editors were telling you, Aaron, in, in that, you know, he would encourage writers to say, uh, you know, oh, and this character is a monk from the Singing Cliffs. What are we doing with the Singing Cliffs? I don't know. I'm just putting, I'm just putting some things together so that you feel like the world is bigger than just where you are. Are the players going to want to go to the Singing Cliffs? Maybe they are. And you, as a writer, you know, as a game master, need to be prepared to design the Singing Cliffs within a franchise, though. And I think this is this is where your editors come in. James Sutter was in a position 
where he could drop singing cliffs and the whatevers all day long because he knows at some point he's going to get to go create those. Your editors are like, please stop dropping new locations in our world. We don't have that budget. Yeah, and uh, we are going to talk more about this and about the iceberg theory when we return from the break. Oftentimes, when we think about tabletop role-playing games, you think big D&D, playing with a bunch of friends, but there are a lot of smaller games that can actually help you build worlds and think about your writing in really interesting ways. And one of them is The Quiet Year from Buried Without Ceremony. What it is is a game where you're mapping out a new community on a table and using playing cards that you probably have in your own home to answer really interesting questions about that community. Like, what are the omens? What's the largest body of water? What are people afraid of? What do they run towards? And I love using this when I'm trying to think about building a new world to make me ask interesting questions that can help to broaden my story and make it that much more interesting. So definitely check out The Quiet Year by Buried Without Ceremony. So I was very excited when you talked about the iceberg <laughs> theory because I love thinking about it. And mm -hmm. one of the things that I think came up earlier was the idea about like the way that character and world building intersect, which I think is even more important in short fiction than it is in longer fiction because it's such it's so much more character focused a lot of the time. And I was thinking like an iceberg has a very different meaning to the captain of the Titanic as it does to somebody who is a cold water swimmer or somebody who is an iceberg diver. That's not a thing, but let's say it is. Um, and where... Climatologist. Climatologist. Thank you. I think that one of the things I like to think about with world building is every single person does not understand the world in the same way. Mm -hmm. And I think that sometimes um, a mistake or something that I see that like gets me under my skin is when it seems like everyone has the same knowledge of the world within mm. a world. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? It's like everyone knows about the Battle of X. Y'all, we barely know our own history going back like <laughs> a year. You know what I mean? Like things that people said everyone would remember. Like I love looking at all the crimes of the century that have existed. Like I remember in Ragtime, the musical, they talk about the crime of the century being like Evelyn Nesbitt's husband murdered her somebody. I don't remember because no one cares. And so I think thinking about like, where, what do your characters know of what the world is and how it works is very different. Even between the three of us, we would probably explain something differently about the way of the world. And that gives you a lot of ways to think about world building, to think about power in world building, to think about, you know, what are the ways in which a world matters. Because if you make the mm. world matter to the character, yeah. then you make the world matter to the reader. So this that that idea of what matters to the character and, and matters to the reader gets back for me to how to control that in short form. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, as you all have been talking, I have I feel like I've had a little bit of an epiphany. Um, let me try this out and see how this fits for you all. So uh, so I was thinking that one of the ways that I will use world building is um, is is for emphasis, and uh, you know that using the puppetry metaphor of focus, that the longer you linger on something, the more important it is to the character. That you know that long gaze. So I think that world building comes in like when we're when we're dropping these specific details for the reader. That there's kind of two modes with a spectrum in between of the decorative flourish and the emphasis, hmm. the, the thing that you're trying to put emphasis on. And with the emphasis, those are the things that the character interacts with. Those are the things where you're going to have to know what the ripple effects are. But then you also have the decorative flourishes, which exist to create tone for the reader. So when you're looking at like your, your PowerPoint slide of, of the things, it's like, do, the, do these fit in the world? It's not just do these fit into the system? It's like, do these support the tone I'm trying to create for the reader in this short form? And is my character interacting with them in a way that moves the story forward? Like, those are, those are the pieces that I think that we're looking at and, and everything else we can kind of, like, if it's not doing one of those two things, it, does it belong in the story? How does that fit? I love this. And yeah. I especially love it because it lets you know when your world building is not going wrong, but where mm -hmm. you may be creating issues for yourself in making your story too big, mm -hmm. is if your decorative flourish feels like something that should have impact on the character, but it's not, mm -hmm. yeah. you treat it as a flourish, 
but it actually like, like, why would they not care? Why would this not be the thing that matters to them? That's when it feels like, okay, now I, I want to go explore that. Mm-hmm. And so part of it is figuring out what should be just a flourish. Yeah. What is just an extra that helps to create tone? And what is it that actually hits the core of your story, which means you have to understand what's the core and the heart of the story and the character. Well, some of the examples you brought up are things that you wanted to be flourishes, but end up being load-bearing in a certain way, right? Like putting a space elevator in your story, you were like, oh, wait, this was supposed to be a flourish, but if I introduce that, complicates things too much, right? And so I think finding that balance, I do love this framework is such the trick of the, the whole thing. The decorative flourish of, uh, oh, you know, this character is, a, you know, a monk from the Singing Cliffs. That's fine. That's decorative. But if we then, you know, a few paragraphs later, talk about this pattern of stucco as being something that is commonly found among the tribes of the Singing Cliffs, suddenly the reader sits forward and says, ooh, Singing Cliffs. That must be important. Mm-hmm. If you didn't want it to be important, don't use that flourish in two places. Yeah, yeah. That because lingering you've gaze. now you've yeah. now created a, a a clue that you didn't want to create. Yeah, I also think it's good to look at your flourishes. This gets back to what you said about like if you put police in, then that's a specific society. I think sometimes the flourishes that we go to are the flourishes we know from our own lives. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, when we're trying to create like a quick obstacle, we might have like a guard, for example, show up because guards prevent you from getting places. But having a guard says something about the system of justice, about a system of power. Mm-hmm. And so even though that may not be what your story's doing, and you may choose in the end not to care about it, one of the things that I also think is fun to do is look at what is the what is the broader world that my flourishes are implying? And is that the world that I want my story to live in? It's such yeah. an interesting one because, you know, as I mentioned, I like to run a lot of RPGs. I do a lot of campaigns and campaign settings. I almost always do homebrew. The challenge I've set myself multiple times and I have failed at every time is to build a city or a world that doesn't have police, right? And this is a way of me pushing and trying to advance, you know, my, my anti-carceral thinking. How do I imagine a world that doesn't have those kind of systems of of power, right? It is very hard, right? It's very hard to envision that world from where we stand right now. And it is so interesting of a way for me to explore this idea and interesting to me in watching the ways in which I failed to do that because I do have an instinct of like, well, the characters did something chaotic. Uh, we need some police to chase them around now, you know? <laughs> or they killed somebody. What do we do about this? Like, what what systems of justice can we put into play here? And it becomes very difficult. Um, but I, I, I do like this idea of that you can use world building as a critical tool in your set, right? I think we think of it so much as a thing just for the characters to bounce off of, but it can be so generative on its own. And I think that's part of why I love RPGs in general is because they, the main tool I have as a GM often is those those world-building rules to influence my characters and guide them and direct them. Um, and so the way that works into fiction is giving your characters those stakes and those things to bounce off of. Yeah, yeah I, I will say that I one of the things that I'm really proud of in my work on Journeys Through the Radiant Citadel is that the setting I created, God's Breath, has no police yeah. and also has no uh, centralized power. Yeah. Um, which is very difficult because it is hard. It's like at the end of a story. It's a fun challenge. You know what I mean? Like you like who is then telling you to go do things? Yep. Who is rewarding you when you come back with stuff? And also like how do you make big changes? Because I think something that we often see in fiction, which doesn't work in the real world but feels good in fiction, is mm-hmm. the idea that like you change the king, you change the world. Yeah. You change the you change the corporate who's like running the evil corporation, the evil corporation fixes itself. And so, like, there's the idea that you want to take an evil and, like, personify it. Mm -hmm. And so figuring out how to make things a little more about the system and less about the person is It highlights how much of our fantasy stories rely on restoration fantasy, right? Mm. And so if you want to tell a, 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 a fantasy story in a high fantasy setting, so much what we're looking for is how do we depose the evil king and restore the rightful heir, right? And when you take out certain elements like policing, like jails, like centralized power, then suddenly you're in a much more complicated world. Uh, and that can be really fun. Also, my players were like, we don't know what to do in this world half the time. And and that was interesting to watch in the ways it failed in that way, because without some of those narrative structures, your audience won't always know how to interact with the world that you've created. Right. And when you're dealing with short fiction, because yeah. you're relying so much on the implication and the pattern seeking that the reader yeah. comes with, you have to be aware of what those societal things are because the reader is going to apply that lens. And if you aren't thinking about it ahead of time, 
yeah. with your world building, even if it's not fully on the page, the the reader will will impose stuff for you. Exactly. Everyone comes to the story with their own baggage and their own mm-hmm. understanding. And, you know, being aware of that and conscious of that is part of your challenge as the creator. Yeah, I will, I will talk really quickly. I know we're getting towards the end of time, but um, one of the things that was a challenge for me when I wrote Snake Season is that it's very much in one person's head who yeah. is very isolated mm-hmm. from the world. And part of the reason that the Conjure Man exists as a character and that also the women that visit, like, exist, you don't see them, but they are, like, mm-hmm. a function in the story is to give you a sense of what the world thinks it is yeah. around her. Mm-hmm. Because otherwise she's just, you don't, you can't tell what's real and what's not real, what's going on. But by having these characters who represent, like, the world trying to exert itself on the character, it gives a way to give some more meat to what's going on mm-hmm. and to tell what is a flourish, you know, and what is actually like a load bearing wall of this exactly. particular narrative. Yeah. We had such a fun conversation over breakfast, Mary Robin and I, over what actually happened in this story, like what's real. And, yeah. you know, I love that it's slippery, right? And I love the implication that there is reality somewhere here, but, you know, your world building elements make it kind of slippery in a way that's really fun and I don't know. It makes it energetic. Well, in but way. Bear in mind that the the reader experience here uh, is this was not a story about what kind of world is this. This is a story about what is this person going to do? What has this person done? And I mean, the reader can go back and ask those larger questions, but the story wasn't created to answer them. The story was created just to, I say just to. Mess with the you. story was created just, just to mess, mess with you. Because, <laughs> yeah. Because, yeah. Because, yeah. because you are the antagonist, going back to a previous episode. But I, but I think what it, it does is that that because it's slippery, because because the, the to refer to the, the, uh, the magic system thing, because uh, the magic system episode, because it is not well-defined, um, it creates more space for the reader to yep. bring themselves into it. And I think that's one of the real powers of short fiction is that all of that implication stuff means that that the reader, the reader, each reader's reaction is going to be different because they are putting more of themselves into the story, I think, in a lot of ways. There's more room for the reader to do that. Yeah. I think we are about at the end of things. Uh, but before we go to the homework... Just a heads up that we are going to be taking a quick pause in this deep dive because National Novel Writing Month is upon us. And as much as I love short fiction, I also love NaNoWriMo as a way to stretch and see what I can do with a different form. And we're going to invite you all to come with us and think about the ways that we can all sit down and write a novel or novel shaped object together. And with that, the homework. Right here. Take a big world building concept. And when I say concept, I mean interrelated, you know, the the whole big world building thing and pick one or two iconic elements that bring it to life for you and then take one of those and make it a key piece of one short scene. This has been writing excuses. You're out of excuses. Now go write. Please rate and review us five stars on Apple Podcasts or your podcast platform of choice. Your ratings help other writers discover us for the first time. Writing Excuses has been brought to you by our listeners, patrons, and friends. For this episode, your hosts were Mary Robinette Kowal, Dong Wan Song, Aaron Roberts, and Howard Taylor. This episode was engineered by Marshall Carr Jr., mastered by Alex Jackson, and produced by Emma Reynolds. For more information, visit writingexcuses.com.